It is Saturday the 22nd of April 2023 and this is the Future of Photography. The Future of Photography. Or is it that day? Well, hey folks, Adrian here, uh, along with Jeremiah, just the two of us again this week. Uh, how are you doing, Jeremiah? I'm doing well, and um, we are going to discuss a very interesting topic, very techy this, this week, very, very um, focused on cameras, focused on black and white. And um, also, I have uh, uh, a big wave from Emer, who sends uh, her love, so um, she... She and I had corresponded this week briefly, and she's doing well. Oh, that's cool. I haven't heard from Ema for a while. I'm glad that she's doing well. Excellent. Yeah. Um, So, our topic this week, Adrian? Well, monochromes, uh, specifically the launch of black and white only cameras. Now, one of these is a surprise to me. One of them is slightly less surprising. Um, and uh, But we thought, actually, seeing as two cameras have been in the news this last week uh, as be, being launched or just about to be launched, um, that are monochrome sensors, so you can only shoot black and white photos with them. Um, I thought, actually, let's have a chat about that. Let's have a chat about that. Uh, especially seeing, as Jeremiah, uh, of the two of us, you have a, a monochrome-only camera. Um, I don't. I do. Um I have had some cameras in the past that I would only use to shoot black and white, but technically speaking, they did have a color filter array and stuff like that. So, so um, I have some idea of the, uh, uh, of what makes a good aesthetic for, you know, or in terms of a camera that would have a a good black and white output, but it's not the same as having a, a, a black and white only camera. So anyway, so the two products, let's go with the two products. Um, first of all, the non surprising one, um, the, uh, Leica M11 monochrome, um, not the first time Leica have produced a monochromatic camera um, and I'm sure it won't be the last Uh, they've done it for the last few digital iterations of the M cameras Uh, I think they've done uh, a Q camera monochrome haven't they Um, and uh, as is their want with Leica um, they charge a premium price for a premium product and uh, less is more so the less you get the more you pay so if you want if you want the black (laughs) and white you have to pay more Um, now no surprises there. I'm sure it's a great camera. Um, the one that did surprise me was the announcement from Rico Imaging of a new Pentax digital SLR monochrome. Uh, and I think it's the K3. It's not an easy one to say. So if I trip over this, uh, yeah, please forgive me, everybody. This is the Pentax K3 Mark III monochrome DSLR. Um, now... Jeremiah, right? Let's talk about the <laughs> let's let's talk about the the, the yeah, use of the user cameras. experience. Let's yeah, talk the, about, about the, the user experience because I think first yeah. we can talk about the business of stuff as well along the way. But yeah. actually, no. I've not used one of these things. So what's what's the appeal for you? Well, uh, I did buy a monochrome M9, their very first one. I remember when they announced it, I was just drooling because I shoot a lot of black and white anyway. I mean, less now. But at the time, uh, I shot a lot of black and white, mainly black and white, printed exclusively in black and white. Um, And I I just thought, wow, this is, you know, it's basically like having permanent plus X (laughs) in your your camera on a limited amount. I studied the specs. I thought it was very interesting because of the way the chip um, organizes its kind of intake is it doesn't have to deal with so much information that it could be very, very sharp. And and, uh, it, and indeed, of course, with Leica's, that's the case. I picked up this M9 used. So um, I, I just, you know, like all things Leica, you know, it's, it's a tall drink to, to buy one of these <laughs> new, uh, yeah. you know, especially as you, as you pointed out, you know, that you cannot, uh, you, you pay a lot more for getting a lot less. Um, if you if you are someone who has been a Leica user, my other camera is an M6 film camera. So I have the lenses, which are 
the kind of stock and trade of Leica generally. And I thought, oh, I, if I can get this at a good bargain, I was like you selling some old gear that I really didn't. I put it on MBH and I, I got some good, uh, you know, good prices for it. So I'd accumulated uh, some some cash for gear. And then I saw this monochrome where I was hunting for it used. So it didn't cost me all that much. Bought the body, was completely blown away by the quality. It Now, I don't know if it was my projection <laughs> on the image because it was A, Leica, and B, monochrome, and, and it was so unique at the time, and nobody had seen this camera. It's like, wow. And uh, so I, I felt that the images were just dazzling. Uh, the experience of using it in terms of exposure, et cetera, the te technique of using it is almost identical to using the M6 and just the way that the analog feel of the camera was, which is, for me, just the beauty of using Leica. I mean, it just doesn't feel that you're always looking at a screen, punching buttons and all of that stuff. And, yeah, you know, I think... People have listened to me know I, I don't run away from technologies and screens. <laughs> no. But when I'm on the street, I, 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 and maybe it's because that's how I learned photography. That was my background in photography, that I could do the settings just without looking at the camera. And boom, I was there. And with all like reportage imagery um, and manual focus, because it had manual focus, it just felt very much like I was using my M6, but digitally, and the quality was great. Now, as I started to use it more and more and more, and this is the dark side of it, um, what started to happen was I started to get um, artifacting on the chip which is a known okay. known thing on those like us. There was um, a deterioration, and they show up as kind of little gray spots on the image. Now, if you use Lightroom, you can generate a, a kind of a filter for that that will take, take those out. And so, but those started to get worse and worse and worse. And I know that, that Leica had, had a kind of a buyback or a where they would switch out the chip for you. Um, and it probably went on for a couple of years. Uh, but I unfortunately missed that deadline when oh. I went to Leica. They were like, oh, I'm sorry. Uh, it'll cost a shit ton of money to, to replace <laughs> it. So that kind of like pissed me off a bit. And uh, around the same time, the Q2 came, which is a color camera. And so I... I was using the Q2. I still am. It's my absolute favorite camera in the universe. Um, and I started to compare the imagery. Now I'm using both, you know, Leica lenses. Um, and frankly, the technology of black and white conversions, and there's so many ways to do this, um, in terms of pixel peeping, I finally decided, well, there, there's not, I can't see really a significant dif difference. I, I, I suppose if I put it under a microscope and and did all that, but but the, the Q2's ISO range is so good. The uh, pixel density is better than the old M9. And, and so it's now sitting there gathering dust <laughs> until I can meet up or or trade it or something at like a, but but um, I think the benefit and this is the bottom line the benefit of the monochrome camera itself you know it doesn't matter if it's a Leica or Pentax or I, there may be others that are coming is the discipline of focusing the photographer on seeing the world purely through black and white. In other words, you don't go out there and start to shoot color pictures. You're looking for light abstraction because there's nothing more abstract than a black and white image, right? Um, despite the fact that we think, oh, 
it must be real because it's black and white. But in fact, <laughs> it has very little to do with reality. And we can circle back to last week's podcast, but I won't go there. Um, I think the discipline of it or the filter on your psychology of taking the pictures with a monochrome picture is what you are paying for. And that's the very limitation that expands the aesthetic experience. This this is really interesting, right? There's two there's two areas of interest in this for me. One is the the capture part of the process, and the other is is the 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 post production element. Um, in the capture uh, element, I, now I've been shooting with digital mirrorless cameras for years at this point, um, and rather than digital SLRs, and of course I also you know like to shoot film cameras as well. Now. One of the things that I find interesting about both this Leica and the Pentax is, of course, they both have optical viewfinders. One is a rangefinder, the other is a, an SLR, um, which, of course, by their very nature, you're seeing the world in colour. Right now, in my black, in my, uh, my black and white, in my mirrorless cameras, uh, when I switch to a black and white capture mode, uh, I get a black and white picture to look at. And I personally actually shoot that way. So so when I'm shooting for black and white, I will have the black and white setting on in the camera and I will compose in black and white, um, which, of course, is not a luxury that is afforded to you on either the Leica or the Pentax SLR. So I, I, I'm a bit, a bit curious about the capture part of the process. When you, when you're shooting with one of these things, does it, do you see something and you think, oh, uh, I'll take that, that, that's caught my eye. I'll capture that. And then when you look at it in, you know, on the screen, you realize that actually what you saw was perhaps a color contrast rather than a tonal contrast. And therefore it's all just come out some sort of middling gray. Does that ever happen when you use these things? Because it's like when you load your camera with plus X, tri X, et cetera, et cetera, right? Um, you, you stop seeing the world in color. You, if you're out there as a photo walk or shooting or, you know, in the field, whatever it is, you're, you're definitely eliminating color from the way you see the world. So uh, that's really what I'm talking about. It, yes, uh, I mean... I love the fact that I can use a rangefinder, focus fast, and or pre-focus that kind of thing. Um, I, I think that's really interesting. Uh, uh, an SLR monochrome—that's uh, that's an odd choice for for a camera engineer's <laughs> well, current this aesthetic. Is, this is but, Ricoh okay. Pentax, isn't it? So they're definitely yeah, yeah, putting I, themselves out there on the fringes these days in terms of the products they bring yeah. to market. Sure. My, I have a warm, uh, you know, and a soft spot in my heart. For me. My first camera, you know, for real, outside of a Rolly Flex, which my father gave me, was an Asahi Pentax. That was my first purchased camera. So, you know, I, I do have a, a soft spot there for it. Um, I'd be curious to try to try it and just see how it feels. But again, I, you know, I revert back to, to the Leica experience. However, at uh, 8,000 pounds, I think it really feels like a, a limited edition collector's item that's artificially limited. Um, and, you know, again, yes, there's developmental costs, et cetera, but that seems a lot, <laughs> a lot um, of cash. Yeah, yeah it well, is. But, but then that's, when you that's consider the market that they... Has to, yeah, uh, they go to that. Obviously, they have success in it. Uh, I... I encourage them to continue. It would be a sad day if like ever went away. Um, they really are a, a, a camera manufacturer that is really quality first and damn the expense. So if you can afford it, uh, it's a very different experience than using other cameras that, that I've used. Uh, but going back to the black and white of it all, um, Sometimes you're out there, snap, snap, snap. And when you look at the images, and they all are black and white, and you will notice, I'm sure of it, on the uh, on the Pentax, a sharper image. And, and that just is in the way the chip has to deal with less information 
in a more critical way. It's just ones and zeros, blacks or whites. That's really it. And, and I think yeah, that you that's can count really, all the photons. You know, yeah, when you when you haven't got a, a color filter in front of your sensor, you can count all the photons, can't you? Rather than just a yes, of more them. efficient. Yeah, yeah, and, and, and so you know, going back to it, I do think it's a tool that is connected to your brain rather than the the opposite. I don't think you go out there and shoot, 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 and go, oh, look, they're all black and white. I think it, <laughs> it goes, use this camera, see in black and white, because that's all you're going to get. And that helps you, it, many people. And when I use my Q2, which you can do color or black and white, um, sometimes I have to think, oh, is this a black and white image or is this a color image? <laughs> I'm always back and forth because I have the choice. When I didn't have the choice of the monochrome, it was liberating, if that makes sense. It it, do, it does, yes, I can see that. I mean, um, because you know, constraint is always liberating, isn't it? In that create in the sense of creativity, you know, the fewer choices you have available, um, you know, the 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 more creative you can be because you don't have to the the pro, the overhead burden of lots and lots of decisions to make yeah. in the moment. Yeah, it's, it's yeah, you know, it's sure. it's why did why did Steve Jobs wear a turtleneck every day? Well, uh, or Barack Obama only have two different colors of suit. Um, it, it's the you know for those two guys who who had you know weightier things on their mind with one kind or another, um, they didn't want to be the decision fatigue of having to decide what to wear. <laughs> yeah, so it's uh, because you know you make as, as the president of the USA, you make a lot of decisions every day, right? So why would you add more decisions that you know that didn't need to be there? So and and I, I do get that. Um, although let's talk about let's talk about the back end of the process then, because of course sometimes you know no matter how good you are, no matter how in the zone you are and seeing the world in black and white, you will either. Um, make an error uh, uh, and, and confuse color tra- contra- excuse me co- color contrast for tonal contrast or perhaps you will see a, a scene that is really compelling right um uh, but it's compelling in part because of the color in the scene and it's difficult to render that just in black and white now if you shoot with well, you wouldn't shoot it you well, wouldn't shoot, shoot it, with then. a color camera even if it's in well, black no, and white but if mode, you have a monochrome you would go Mm, no. Well, so so even even okay. So even if you were, and this is a is, is a bit of a hypothetical situation because of course if you shoot with a color camera, you can always then take that image and process it in color. But you can um, do things like play with color channels in a black and white conversion to change the you know the tonal. So if you had something yep. that was yellow, light yellow, and something that was light blue, right? You know to um uh, contrasting colors but if they were tonally similar you could actually you know play with the luminosity for each of those color channels and and actually create a tonal contrast as well um so you have more options to you i guess in the post production side if you've shot your black and white on a camera with a color filter is that I, I don't know uh, that that's massively important <laughs> yeah. to me. It doesn't happen very often. So perhaps, um, perhaps I'm just you know who would be clutching its draws here. You know who? You, probably you are. And and I I think now that I'm using my Q2, which has gives me the option, um, uh, I, I I don't think I would buy another monochrome. Um, but for pixel peepers those that still exist and are going like, oh, yeah, there's just no comparison with the quality. I'm, I'm sure the 11 is a dazzler of a camera. And in fact, you know, I would think that just for shits and giggles, I would probably rent one for a day. If Renting could be cool. Yeah, that's you know, a nice if, way to if try it. If it struck me. Yeah use my lenses and take it out for a walk and, and, and do some pixel peeping myself. Pixel I peeping must be, be very so tiring though, right? In 2023, I don't know how many pixels yes. there are on a Leica M11. I'm imagining yeah, well, it's quite a lot of pixels. <laughs> yeah, I, I haven't read the specs, but I can't imagine it's less than, say, a 48 megapixel so in, two, uh, in 2005, uh, when we were con- yeah, in 2005, when we consider ourselves lucky to have six megapixels, perhaps um, that, that now you know cameras have 60 megapixels, quite a lot of them, uh, and it's like so that's yeah, that's a lot, that's a lot of pixels. 
<laughs> yeah. But, uh, by the way, in, you know, in, in TV production, certainly because we know that the images are going to be right now, the best quality would be 4K, right? That, 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 yep. You know, on your on your on your screen. So if I'm shooting in 4K, which I do, um, that's about as max as I can go. I, you know, I can get 8K, which one would do if we're doing a lot of kind of blowing up or special effects, whatnot. 6K maybe. Uh, of course, you compare the prices of storage of all your data and transfer and all of the rest. But generally, 2K on a 4K monitor looks. <laughs> looks pretty fantastic, you know, and, and there, there's just that limit, I suppose. And I've seen 8K OLED uh, uh, screens and they are, <laughs> they, they'll pop the eyes right out of your, your head. And while they're great for a football game, soccer, et cetera, baseball, they look amazing for sports. You can actually see the ball, right? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Moving. I mean, it's really, really good, especially if your settings are right. But for drama, often it's just too sharp. Yes, I mean you could see every pore, and you know I did a, a I did just to, you know a, a tangentially many years ago when I was doing commercials, I did a um, a, a spot using uh, IMAX cameras for uh, at the time the Canadian government of tourism. It was up on the IMAX screen at some. Uh, you know, some celebration of the centennial or something like that. But, you know, a close-up on a IMAX camera is like basically calves up because if you go closer, the audience is like, whoa, oh, God, <laughs> it's monstrous. It's just too much. So, you know, you're, you're you know, in terms of pixel peeping and, and sharpness and all of that stuff, you know, sometimes too much is just too much. Sometimes it's not enough. And it, you really have to select the tools based on what it is you want. And sometimes you may not, um, for all your friends and family and, and general people looking at the final image, you know, maybe it's printed at 300 DPI, you know, rather than 12,000 DPI on some futuristic printer that doesn't exist yet. But, you know, Whereas they won't be able to tell any difference between the images, you know, you'll feel better because you know <laughs> in your heart, right? It's the difference between like, oh, yes, I have a Gucci bag or, you know what I mean? That kind of LMVH culture of feeling that you're special <laughs> rather than, you know, a bag is a bag is a bag. You're carrying around your, your, your stuff in it and do you need to pay four thousand dollars for a Hermes bag <laughs> that's really what do you call it you know it's just social signaling is really what it is it's telling everyone oh I'm wealthy I'm a, I'm a very very uh, attractive mate <laughs> in waiting I guess <laughs> well I I, there, there's there so <sighs> Depend if it's about the output, I, I can see some sense in it. So the, the the thing I always use to describe this is that is the very famous photograph that Arnold Newman took of Igor Stravinsky. You know the one where he uses the the lid of the mm -hmm. piano as a as a as a big yeah. negative space and, and and makes it look like a, a musical yeah. notation in in the photo. And poor little poor little Igor, it's just, his head is just sticking in the little in the left hand bottom yeah. corner. Of the, it's just really a picture of the piano. It's got yeah, but. Um, but of course, you know, uh, that's a good example. If you ever see the contact sheet for that image, um, it's a good example of, of, of an artistic crop. Um, and uh, I can see why in that sense, you know, uh, especially on something like the Q2, where you have a, a fixed lens that actually the ability to crop in um, and still retain a high quality image could be quite useful. Um so, yeah. yeah, but on the Q2, when you there's a button you push that that changes the focal length or the certainly the appearance of focal length. You know, uh, you go 28 and then you go to 50 and then you go 75, and you know it's smaller and smaller. But when you take the picture, it comes out full size. The, it's not just blowing it up. The the advantage of the Q2's technology, as I understand it, is. The processing of these kind of blow-ups within are so married to the lens, the capture, 
There's settings yeah. that it doesn't really feel that you're doubling the blow up of it. It really does feel great. And, and it, it's even when you're, you're at its maximum blow up, which is, I think, seven megapixels, you know, at its smallest within right. the camera. Okay, yeah, from that, the that center of the like, sensor, yeah. It really is so dazzlingly sharp, you just can't put it together. And that's their technology at work. That's a bit different than pulling a, a, an image from a 28 millimeter on your Photoshop uh, app and kind of just doing a big blow up and yeah. you're going to get noise yeah, and, yeah. you know, all of that. But now also with new uh, uh, Lightroom and uh, Topaz, all the rest, to reduce noise. And also we're seeing more AI sharpening tools where if things are a little fuzzy, it will fill in pixels and sharpen. So soon these, these pixel peeping discussions are going to be completely moot because A, the technology in the camera or out of the camera is going to take care of those kinds of things. I, I see, you know, blurry photographs that are sharpened that look absolutely sharp because it knows, oh, that's an eye. Oh, it's a blue eye. Oh, there's a highlight in the middle and the white here. And I know what an eye is. And so it'll just sharpen that eye, even though there's no information there. And that's pretty good. Clever, clever stuff. Okay. So in conclusion, then, um, we, we are excited to see that there are monochrome cameras uh, being released into the market because um, it's always good to see new stuff uh, and, and things that push the boundaries. Uh, I don't think either of us are going to buy one of these. Um, and the, the conclusion seems to be buy the color version of the Leica Q2 um, and, and do it all with one of those. For sale. One <laughs> For sale. M9. Well, I, I did, yeah, yeah you've, you're obviously on the Leica mailing list. You know there's a Q3 around the corner. You want to sell your Q2 before the values plummet. Is that right? <laughs> Uh, I, I I would be tempted. <laughs> <laughs> okay, all right. Well, there we go. Monochrome cameras. Um, I'm just going to do a very quick pick of the week before we go to your main pick of the week. Um, uh, my pick of the week is the Fuji X20, which is a point-and-shoot camera from ooh, maybe 2013, 20, something like that. I did have one. Uh, I no longer have one. And it's probably the only camera I've ever had and sold that I actually miss. Um the reason for mentioning that is that it had an amazing in-camera black and white setting um, uh, that I just loved the images that came out of that as black and white JPEGs. So those are, that's my little sad tribute to a camera I loved and lost. But Jeremiah, you've got the main oh, pick of the week. Before I go to my, my pick, I will just second that emotion because I had that very camera and that was in the package that I sold when I bought the monochrome. So I do oh. also miss it. It was a fabulous camera anyway, and very analog feel. So I yes, love it. Indeed. Yeah, yeah. Um, pick of the week. Um, you'll see it. It's a, you know, obviously it's <laughs> not great for audio, but it's just a photographer whose work is, um, I guess in, in an amazing aesthetic, um, I just invite you to look at the notes. Uh, his name is, I, I, if I, I'm going to muck it up, but it's um, Elda Gesson. <laughs> yes. and, and anyway. That's um, what I would Boris have said. Elda Boris, Boris Elda Gesson, Elda Gesson, Elda Gesson. Something like that, yes. Uh, yeah, and, and he said eldagesson.com, e L D A G S E N dot com. Uh, his his work. He has something called pseudonomenesia, <laughs> fake memories, and ah, okay. uh, these uh, again. These are again in my wheelhouse. In just in terms of 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 all of the kind of work that he does. But he's the one who won this particular. Um, uh, you know, juried prize and 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 had given it up that, um, that we spoke about last week uh, to create. That's right. And so, uh, looking at his work, both his pure uh, photographic work and his um, AI work, is is something um, to behold. Uh, he's a very very talented man. I don't know him, but um, and I didn't know his work before he generated the controversy. But um, <laughs> I think the blurring between um, 
the created work and the captured work is something that he's obviously thinking deeply about. Um, he's pissed off about it in some ways. I'm not, but uh, therein lies the rub. Oh, yes. So thank you very much for joining us this week. Yeah, uh, yes, this has been the future of photography. Uh, I'm not sure we even have Chris back next week, actually. So because uh, Chris is Chris is very busy with workshops uh, at the moment, uh, and so um, we may need to do another one or two shows without him. Uh, but. Jeremy and I will keep uh, keep cranking the handle, uh, as it were, and bringing you little nuggets of photography uh, gossip and uh, fun every week. Uh, and we will see you. We won't see you. We will speak to you uh, next week. Take care, everybody. Bye bye. Bye. <laughs>